Good morning. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a medium-sized small business in Silicon Valley. Uh, previously, I was a financial analyst, financial journalist, and a research engineer in telecommunications. I was also an elected uh, Bernie Sanders delegate. Um, and uh, when others are stating what you need to hear, I tend to stay silent. Um, there's no need to just add voices to the chaos that we're in nowadays. <clears throat> um, but I hope I can add a little bit of value uh, today to the discourse. Uh, so obviously, um, I disagree with the vast majority of uh, Donald Trump's policies as they've unfolded to date. But I always do believe there's more than one way to approach a problem. You can approach problems with a limited government, or you can approach them uh, with a, uh, a strong regulation. Um, and uh, what we want to do is to d talk about public policy. Um, now, in order to create huge political movements, there needs to be emotion, there needs to be outrage and all of this. Um, but if the din of outrage uh, gets to a certain fever pitch, um, it threatens to devour its young, like uh, in the French Revolution where the people were guillotined. And uh, So I'm in Chile uh, at Playa Negra in Concon right now, my wife's country, and uh, I've met a lot of people here and talked about the political system here. And um, people, I don't feel they can change things, although they like this uh, mayor of Valparaiso, whose name is Sharp who is about, only about 30 years old and uh, seems to be actually making things happen. But they're all predicting he'll end up corrupt with no evidence whatsoever. It's just this sort of end game they assume will happen to everyone. They believe that every leader betrays the people ultimately. And, um, uh, and they're in deep uh, sh you know, shock here because of the American-backed uh, uh, military coup when there was a democratically elected socialist who came from the upper classes, uh, Salvador Allende, and uh, then there was uh, this military coup supported by the U.S. because of two primary reasons for the Chilean. So there's a few families that have run Chile f uh, from the beginning, and there have been great struggles here. Um, with the uh, working class people, with uh, the merchant class people. It, it isn't just a set of ruling families and nobody else gets to do anything. Um, but the two big factors were that, uh, or three, one was the threat to nationalize uh, assets controlled by uh, U.S. multinational corporations such as the copper mines, uh, there was uh, ITT was here, International Telephone and Telegraph. I don't know whether this was about communications or about natural resources. So U.S. businesses could have lost money. Um, and then, of course, the same threat occurred to the ruling class here. The, the, uh, and it's very, very race-oriented here. There's basically three races in Chile. There's a, a white race of Europeans that came in and... Uh, 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 put the place to the torch and uh, subdued everyone, forced them to stop speaking their native languages, erase their memory, just like in the United States. And uh, this white ruling class, so when you see advertisements in the country, everybody's got their hair dyed blonde. Most of the uh, figures have blue or green eyes. When the majority of people here are um, between a quarter and a half native, they're uh, all over, and, and Mediterranean, so they're darker skinned people, and they tend to have brown hair, black hair, and brown eyes. Those are not the people that, uh, and a funny thing, when you walk around on the streets, uh, it's like going to a, a, a high school, if you're, if you're uh, socially aware, uh, although I may be projecting a little bit, but the, the kids that look white, tend to have a carefree, smiling attitude like the popular kids in high school, and the people that look brown may look a little bit uh, more serious. Uh, there's a different tone. It's, 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 uh, the roles are played out. And, um, 
And so you've got this self-hatred of being uh, brown-skinned with dark hair and brown eyes. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not making this up. I talked to a, a communist who had been shot uh, uh, when he was handing out leaflets when he was 15, almost lost his genitals. Uh, all he did go on to have three kids, which was, uh, he was, the guy who shot him, he said, uh, you're not going to reproduce, basically, uh, uh, you dirty damn communist, and shot him in the groin, and actually uh, circumcised him with the bullet. Uh, uh, and he's still very upset about this, and it's been 35 years. Um, so that coup that happened in Chile taught people here some bad lessons. One is that if you, uh, try to stand up for what's yours. So that's basically the brown people. It was their country. It was a paradise. Um, there was water flowing in many places that water no longer flows now, not just from climate change, but from poor management of uh, water. Um, and there's, uh, so, uh, so these, these white-skinned people um, have stolen everything from them and then sort of rub it in their faces. So anytime there's a popular revolt. Um, the ruling class calls on the military um, to suppress people and it's a country that at the time had a population in 72 probably around less than 10 million people and at least 3,000 were murdered, at least 10,000 were tortured um, and there was a general you know sense of impunity. Um, and um, there were lots of stories to tell but this, this communist fellow who runs a uh, hostel up in the north of Chile, a uh, lovely man who lived in France for a long time. Uh, you know, he said, if you're dark, you're shit here. That's what we, he put it. So uh, it's, uh, and the people are apathetic. Um, they don't feel like they can change things. And they have a terrible lesson that they learned, which was when they had their hopes up, um, everything was taken away from them. You know, there was a curfew, there were police on the streets, military on the streets with machine guns all the time, checkpoints everywhere. You couldn't, certain kinds of music were forbidden. A musician had his hands cut off because he uh, sang Woody Guthrie-like songs here. And there's a lesson for us here in the U.S. from this, which is, um, you know, what happens when power is really challenged uh, is that uh, the reaction can be horrendous. and. Uh, so with Donald Trump, who's a man I, I disagree with most of the 90% of the policies I've heard from him, um, nonetheless, within the context of our system, he was elected, and he, was, he did say we should end these regime change perpetual wars once and for all. Um, and it's ironic that if we're trying to combat Islamic terrorism, that we're invading countries that are anti-Islamic terrorism. Syria was a country that, by and large, did not want religious extremists uh, running the show. Um, it was a secular socialist police state. Although they had elections, uh, not at perfectly fair, but neither, neither ours. Um, you know, the minority uh, religions uh, cling to the state because anything else could expose them to uh, expulsion and um, Libya. Uh, so we're, we're in Iraq. These are countries that are the opposite of hotbeds of Islamic extremism when we attack them. And Trump was ag against these wars for that reason. Um, so Trump seems like a what you see is what you get guy, although we're waiting on the parts that we did like, which is also uh, his concern about the intelligence agency. So this has to do with the hollowing out of the U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy, um, you know, we should be able to reduce labor more and more and more, and then that means people have choices. They can be artists, they can go into scientific research, um, uh, they can um, be craftspeople, uh, so we don't just have ugly strip malls everywhere. So to cut Fast forward a bit, you know, this is about the vision. So why, we always have to keep the vision in mind. My vision, which I think many people share in one form or another, is that we should be self-sufficient in our regions. Uh, so if you're in uh, Western Kentucky or the Bay Area in California or 
uh, in the uh, Araucania in Chile, that with technology we can produce most of the things we need and it creates connectedness in the community and meaningfulness if the pottery, if the tools, uh, if the work is done here. So in Chile, for example, they don't even, in Chile's main economic backbone is copper. Ideally, they should really renationalize the copper and use that money to pay for their higher education uh, because uh, education here has become very expensive, as in the U.S. And uh, their neighbor Argentina, their neighbor Brazil, both have much more affordable. Uh, in, in Argentina, it's entirely free higher education. In Brazil, it's nearly free. Uh, although Brazil is going through terrible economic convulsions, but um, these, if regions were self-sufficient, then you could have different approaches. You could have a libertarian approach where you said, if we meet certain requirements of education, of health, and so forth, we can do it without taxation. We can do it through voluntary organization. Um, so that could be one model. And if the model drops below some level, then the taxes kick in and the state ensures these services are properly provided. And we could require that in a uh, uh, non-statist method, uh, a non-coercive method, that every person had uh, access to higher education and health care um, in a way that was affordable for all the people. Um, how you would define that, uh, that the devils are in the details. And then the, you can do things with cooperatives. Um, that's also non-compulsory. You could organize cooperatives uh, for education, for medicine, uh, for communications. Um, because so the hollowing out of our economy is about a fifth of our economy now is related to the military, industrial, intelligence, legal system. And a lot of its business is um, overthrowing other countries that don't give enough access to our corporations. A lot of its business is conducting war for the profits of the corporations, which is an uh, uh, inconceivably evil thing. Um, a lot of its business is incarcerating people based on the war on drugs. Um, and, uh, you know, drugs should be legal, all of them, and should be uh, administered through a medical system. It's, uh, by criminalizing them, you create, by definition, a mafia, prohibition, uh, doesn't work. Stigmatizing doesn't work. Portugal shows us that if you destigmatize heroin addicts, um, that a big piece of the cycle of addiction is shame, hiding, compartmentalization, uh, sort of like coming out of the closet. Um, so, uh, what we have in the U.S. right now uh, uh, with the uh, anti-Russian hysteria is very concerning uh, that we have people actively calling for basically a coup against Trump. And um, this uh, deep state, what happened with Flynn, for example, is let's say you're a poli... So what's happening with Trump's people is you may find them completely bizarre and hard to understand, but he has certain people that are outsiders. People like Steve Bannon, the alleged white supremacist, and some people know him personally, say he's a real piece of work. He's not a very nice person. He's an incredibly accomplished guy, uh, has produced movies, uh, worked in investment banking in Goldman Sachs, was a Navy officer. Um, so I've never met him. Uh, and if he stays in, in, uh, in the game, it would be interesting to, to take his measure. Um, but he's an outsider.